Okay, let's start. Uh, I passed uh, some uh, pieces of paper there. Please fill it up just because of the, mostly for the supervision time. <coughs> so we were having supervisions on Mondays and Thursdays around 4 p.m. So you choose which of the two days you can. Uh, we can make the, the two groups if, 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 if there is a need, because I can see that some of you may not want to come to the supervisions. They, you're not planning to take this course for examination. But uh, I, I will encourage you to, to at least to come to supervisions are very good. OK. So we are in the We're talking about the supersymmetry algebra, and uh, we we discussed um, in the last lecture the history of supersymmetry, and uh, the important point is was that we needed to add something to the Poincaré uh, uh, algebra to have uh, particles of different spins in the same multiplet, and that's essentially the the reason of supersymmetry, and. Uh, <coughs> So even though historically it wasn't built in this way, in 1975, there was an interesting paper of uh, Hack, Lopusonski, and Sonius, that uh, what they did is that essentially they took seriously the coleman mandula theorem. and added fermionic generators, so spinor generators. And that's a, that's a way of, 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 uh, of building the supersymmetry algebra. Notice that this was after Wes and Zumino. So the, the, essentially the, the idea of supersymmetry was already uh, known. But this paper took the, what is supposed to be the historical approach. Yes? Is this the first paper to point out that, they, that supersymmetry avoided the coleman mandula I think so. I think so. And uh, I think it's the, it's the paper that, that trace back the, the problem that uh, in, uh, in the other ones, they, they were discovering supersymmetry without making contact with the coleman mandula and, and, and so they, they took this, um, this approach seriously. And then they said, well, now let's, ha let's try to build the algebra, including the spinners. OK. <coughs> so, so essentially, they generalized. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So th this is uh, what we have uh, to see. So today we will try to build the algebra as in the way that these people did uh, 30 years ago. OK. So first, remember that Poincaré, Poincaré algebra is uh, the generators are only two. This is the, the T mu and the M mu nu that I told you before. So in principle, you could have thought of operators of any tensorial character, but they happen to be only two vectors and antisymmetric tensors. OK, there are no, with nothing else with higher indices or anything like that. So that's part of the, say, we'll say the coleman mandula theorem. <coughs> And I will not write for you the algebra that, that I wrote the first day. It's just you know the commutators of p and p is zero, p and m is p, and so on. <coughs> but we know the algebra. And uh, so, <coughs> what we have to do today is to see what is it, what kind of new generators we, we will add to make a, a supersymmetry algebra. Okay. So. For supersymmetry, we'll add 
<coughs> generators in the one half zero representation, which I, we will call Q alpha, and with an index capital A, where <coughs> Well, alpha equals to 1 to 2, and uh, a equals 1 all the way to the number n. n is, we will see how big it can be, but in principle, you, we are adding objects which are spinorial, and many of them. How many of them? As many as this number n. And we will also add operators in the 0, 1 half representation. So that means that there will be the Q bar alpha dot, also with index A. Okay. <coughs> and uh, you will see, we will not prove it, but it's, 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 it can be proven. And if you are curious, uh, you can see it, uh, the proof in Weinberg, is that there are no more generators that you, you can add. So, so there will not be operators with with uh, representations a comma b arbitrary spinorial representations of uh, of uh, the SC two cross two spin indices. So <coughs> so no more. So this will be the full thing we add. So, for instance, no one one half and so on. In the same way that that. Uh, the kind of bosonic operators p mu and mu nu stop with two indices. Then the the spinorial generators only have the one spinorial uh, index. And uh, essentially, the proof goes that uh, you try to make uh, things com of commuting q's and q's and q's and q bars. The right hand side has to give you one of the bosonic operators, and uh, since you stop at, at two indices here, you cannot have too much freedom here to multiply uh, spinorials, m many of these spinorial uh, uh, operators with different powers. So that's essentially the proof. So you have to do a Klebsch gordon kind of analysis of, of the composition of products of representations to say that, that you cannot go beyond this. And uh, as, as I, said, I, will have, I will not give the proof here because it's a bit uh, cumbersome, but there's nothing complicated. You don't know Klebsch gordon coefficients and these kind of things. You can follow the argument, for instance, in, in Weinberg's book. But uh, the import, what I will concentrate to see today is to see what is the, the algebra that these operators satisfy combined with, um, with um, generators of the Poincaré group. Immediately, we can see that, that uh, the algebra will be different from a typical algebra we are used to, because the algebra we are used to are, are just based on commutators, because commutators are, 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 are what come out uh, um, when we do a standard Lie group uh, symmetry in the system. Uh, but since we have here objects that anti-commute, we have to extend our definition of an algebra, and to include. But it will be but, uh, the extension will be something that is called a Grassmann algebra, or uh, yes, or, or a graded algebra. Sorry. And a graded algebra. It's such that you have two operators O, so O A, O B, minus Typical algebra. If this uh, eta were zero, this would be a typical commutator, giving you the right-hand side, a linear combination of the operators. Here is uh, generalized to include this factor here, for which eta eta a is equal to zero for O a a bosonic generator. And eta a equals to one for a fermionic generator. Fermionic in the sense that it's a spinorial. Hmm. 
And eta itself is called the grading. So you can see that naturally for eta equal to zero for uh, bosons, so this is a one, and we, stand, we get the standard commutator. If we have, uh, so for instance, two fermions, so this will give you one, so minus one to the one is minus one, with this minus will give you a plus, that will give you an anti-commutator. Okay. So this, this includes commutators and anti-commutators depending on the values of eta. And if you have a bosonic with a fermionic, so it's still zero. So you, always, you will get commutators unless you have two of these fermionic <laughs> operators. So th that is uh, the first thing we have to do. We have to generalize the concept of an algebra to a, a graded algebra. So, for supersymmetry, as I told you, we have the generators. It's a P mu and mu nu, Q alpha A and Q bar alpha dot A. And uh, and as I said, A going from uh, 1 to N. Uh, for N equals to 1, this is called uh, N equals 1, or a simple supersymmetry. And for N greater than 1, it is called extended supersymmetry. <coughs> it's just a definition. So we will first discuss the case of n equals to 1, which is the simplest one. We will see that it's also the most relevant for phenomenology. And uh, later on, we will go to, to extend the supersymmetry to, to describe the general algebra for any value of, of n. Okay. <coughs> so we'll start. So n equals to 1. We already know the commutators. We know the commutators of uh, p mu p mu with a p mu with m mu nu, m uh, nu sigma, and m mu nu and m rho sigma. We already know those ones. So I will not. I will not write them again. So, so now the only thing we need to know, need to find, are are the following. We need to find what is the generator of the following commutators. We need to find um, I'm not writing the second index of Q because it's, it's only one. In, it's only one Q. The, now the the A index since I A is equal to one, so I only write one index. So Q alpha, Q alpha P mu. Then we need to find now an uh, computer Q alpha Q beta. Q alpha Q bar, beta dot. And also, if there are any uh, 
commutators, which I will call this C, where Ti's are internal symmetries. Okay. So we know that the, the, because of Coleman Mandula theorem, the Ti's they commute with the P's and the M's. But we have to see if this thing happens with the, with the Q's. Okay. Okay. So I will spend essentially the rest of the lecture try to find each of these commutators or anti-commutators. Question? Yes? What do you mean exactly by internal symmetry generators? Because usually the internal symmetries are discrete and not really true these symmetries. So what is the is a generator for discrete? No, no, they're not necessarily discrete. The internal symmetries, they can be like the, the U1 that describes electromagnetism. That's continuous. Or the young meals, the SU3 crosses 2 crosses 1 of the standard model. It's, it's an it's a internal symmetry. It's continuous. And so, so, yeah, so in that sense, that, that's, that's what I... Yeah. Yes, thank you for, for the point. Yeah. Yes. As, at some point, I will also address some issues about discrete symmetries, but this is ju just for, for the continuous symmetries. Okay. So... Let's start. Let's start with the first. <clears throat> to, find, to find the commutator of Q, of Q and M, we, we need to know the following information. We, know, we need to know that Q alpha is a spinner. it has this index alpha. So we know it's, it's a spinner. So knowing that it's a spinner, it has to transform on, on the uh, spinorial representation of the Lorentz group. And since the M's are the generators, we can get information. So in particular, uh, since it is a spinner related to this index, we know that Q prime alpha equals to e to the minus i over 2 omega mu nu, sigma mu nu, alpha beta times q beta. Hard to see in the shadow. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Please also let me know if, if, if you need me to write uh, with bigger characters. <clears throat> okay, so we know that Q is a spinner, so it transforms on the, in the spinorial representation as a left-handed spinner. And uh, we can do this transformation infinitesimally. And this will be 1 minus i over 2 omega mu nu sigma mu nu alpha beta q beta. OK. So that, that information we know. We know that since Q is a spinner, it transforms in this way. And infinitesimally, uh, it gives us this transformation. OK. Notice that for knowing the algebra, the only thing we, know, we need to know is the infinitesimal <laughs> transformation. So we are doing the right thing so far. We need to, know, to stop, say, at the first term in the expansion of the exponential. But now Q is not only a spinner. So you, you can look at Q. It has an index alpha, so it's a spinner. But it's more than a spinner. It's not a simple spinner. It's something, it has something special. It's also an operator. It's, it's an operator because that's the kind of object we want to see how it commutes or anti-commutes with, with, with itself or with the other generators. So Q is, as an operator it also transforms under Lorentz transformations. So. Q is also an operator. So that means that as an operator, it transforms as follows. It 
transforms like a, in terms of, of a matrix U, where U equals e to the minus i over 2 omega mu nu times the generators of the Lorentz uh, group, the abstract generators. Okay. Notice we have two, two ways of writing generators of the Lorentz group. This M is just the general generators, the, the, uh, the, the operators themselves that act on any operator in this way. An operator like, like a matrix transforms like a U dagger Q U. Whereas here we're using the sigmas as the generators because the sigmas are the, the things that transform a spinner because this is the, the, the two dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. Okay. So, so this is important. And this is the standard way of you, this is the standard way to do the same, the, for instance, you want to derive what is the algebra of uh, P's and M's, you do exactly the same steps that I'm doing here, with the difference is, is that this step, you, we know that the P's transform as a vector under, under the Lorentz group, so the generators will not be the sigmas, but the corresponding generators in the vector representations. And that's how you get the algebra of the M's and the P's. So I'm doing the same steps, but for the Q's. And uh, so we can then write, do the same thing as we did here. We can write this infinitesimally. So this will be like 1 plus i over 2 omega mu nu m mu nu times q alpha times u, which is 1 minus i over 2 times that. Okay, so now we can we have two expressions for Q prime, and we can just compare them. Notice that the first is the, the unity, one alpha beta Q beta that will give us a Q alpha. Here the unity. Q alpha times the unity is against Q alpha, so that cancels. Okay, so the, the important term is the next one. Are you are you following? Yeah. Good. Uh, but one question. Yes. Uh, how do we know that this Q alpha prime low is the same as uh, the one above? Oh, because it is transforming. As uh, in t you are applying to it Lorentz transformations. You take any operator, it will transform in this way. And you take any any spinner, and it will transform in this way. I mean, the spinner uh, transformation above is corresponding to the Lorentz transformation below. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So they are the same. So the same omegas. So the same. The same. The same uh, uh, parameters of the transformation. Yeah. Yes. Very good. So the, the identity. Cancel in both way, in both cases. Uh, uh, one cancels the other one. Then uh, now we take the terms proportional to, to the omegas, and, uh, <coughs> and we will get. Uh, well, I will try. I will be more explicit. So the first one will give me a Q alpha minus i over two omega mu nu. Alpha beta Q beta equals this one will be the Q alpha again, and then we have I over two. I will factorize the with a minus sign just to compare minus I over two omega mu nu, and then this will be a bracket. The minus sign I get by multiplying this times one. So that will be Q alpha and mu nu. And the plus sign, I'll take it here with the minus, it will be multiplying <coughs> this one times that one times one. So it's M mu nu times Q alpha. 
And then that, that is, that gives us the, our final result. Then this term cancels that, as I told you before, the two terms pro uh, uh, coming from the unity matrix. Then the terms proportional to omega mu nu, they have to be equal to each other. The factor i over two is for the same factor for both, so I have, I will write now the, the, um, the right hand side first and the, so I have Q alpha commutator with a mu nu, which is this term, equals to what I have here, which is sigma mu nu alpha beta times Q beta. And this is the, the, the first commutation relation. Okay, so that tells us how Q and N commute. And uh, it makes sense, as I, as I told you, this always, now these steps are always the same. So look at what, uh, the way to read this equation is to say that N acting on Q gives us sigma mu nu alpha beta q beta. So that's, uh, that means that q transforms in the spinorial representation of the Lorentz group. So that's a way of reading it. Okay. So you will see the same thing we'll, we will say when we do the commutation of m and p. The right-hand side is the way that a vector transforms on the Lorentz transformation. So you can read something out of the commutation relations. Okay, so we are done with the first one. So let's continue with the second. For the second one, we have Q alpha P mu. There, there are two ways of, uh, of, uh, of proving this. There is an easy one. And there's a difficult one. I, I don't think I will ask you to vote because you will choose the difficult one because I'm sure you will not believe me, the, the easy one. <laughs> so I'll do the difficult. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> for this one, we, have, we can see that what has to be on the right hand side, and the right hand side has to be an object with indices alpha and mu. <clears throat> so can you see anything that we can write on the right hand side? Remember that the right hand side has to be linear on the generators. It has to be linear on the p's, the m's, and the q's. So it has to have something times m plus something times p plus something times q and plus something times q bar. Okay. Okay, we know already that this is a anti-commuting and this is a commuting, so the right hand side has to be anti-commuting. So you, we cannot have just M's or just P's. And uh, actually the only thing you can write down, which is saturates all the indices as well, is a, is a constant, a constant you can always write, times, um, Sigma mu, alpha, alpha dot, times q bar, alpha dot. Okay. So that, that is why these objects were important, as I was telling you before, uh, in the first uh, couple of lectures. So this essentially helps us to change one type of indices to another type of indices. So look that we have sigma mu that carries the, the p mu index, and then the, the alpha, you have to come up with an alpha dot, and then it has to come only with a q bar, not, not, not with a q. Okay, and that's it. We cannot write anything else that, is, uh, the, that, that uh, has the same transformation properties as the left-hand side. Still, I haven't told you what the constant c is, and that's the problem now, to fix what the constant is. Okay, so to fix the constant C, we need to know uh, another piece of information, and it is we need to know the complex conjugate of this transformation, because notice that I'm talking about the Q alpha P, 
But we also need to know the Q bar, alpha dot with P. That, that will come out to be the, the a joint of this uh, uh, transformation. So Q bar alpha dot mu equals C star sigma bar mu alpha dot beta times q beta. And uh, you can get from this to that one by taking adjoints on both sides. It's not as easy as it looks. You can, you, uh, this is the adjoint of that one, essentially. So you have to take, you take the adjoints of this, just ch change the order, because you have the adjoint of a product, the, you change the order. So you will get a minus sign q bar p mu, because q bar is the adjoint of that. The join of C is C star, so so far it's okay. The join of Q bar looks more or less like Q, so it's okay. This looks not very um, simple because it, the sigmas are self-adjoint matrices. And all the sigmas that the Pauli matrices are self-adjoint. However, when you take that join, when you do the, the, the process here, you will get the sigma bars, because you will get some epsilons. Remember that sigma bar and the sigmas are related by products of epsilons. Uh, since I know uh, people in the past have had a problem just to, so it's, uh, I will just say, take a join. <laughs> and use that uh, Q alpha dagger is equal to Q bar alpha dot. <coughs> but also that uh, sigma Q index alpha dagger equals to, it will be Q, da Q dagger, which is Q bar, times sigma mu. Alpha dot. Here I use that the Q bar is the adjoint of sigma, of, of, of Q, Q bar is the adjoint of Q, and sigma is self adjoint. And it's good to treat it as a, as, a, as a whole object by itself, otherwise, if you try to do component by component, you get confused. Okay, that's just a, a hint. You can, you can try it at home. Okay, so, but this is true. Now that, if, so if this is true, that is true, and then we, I want to find what the value of the constant C is. So for finding the value of the constant C, I will use the Jacobi identity. These are just standard commutators, so we have to use, we can use the Jacobi identity. The Jacobi identity tells you that A, B, C plus uh, C, a, B plus B, C, A is zero. Okay, and that, that we know from standard commutators. <coughs> okay, so let's take the Jacob identity for which A equals to P mu, say, B equals to P nu and C equals uh, Q alpha. So this implies that we have uh, P mu, P nu, Q alpha plus Q alpha. P mu P nu plus P nu Q alpha P mu equal to zero. So we have three terms. Uh, this term is zero because the piece, the piece uh, commute with themselves. So. <coughs> Uh, 
Now we'll see the, the P nu and Q alpha. We know we can read it from there. And the same thing with this Q alpha and P mu, we can read it from the first equation upstairs. So this implies that we have P mu and this, uh, sorry, I want to imply here. Mm -hmm. The P nu with Q alpha, it will give us a minus sign, minus C, sigma nu alpha alpha dot times Q bar alpha dot. Okay, these are just numbers. I can t I can take them out of the of the commutator and only write the commutator of P and Q bar. This one is zero, so that one is P nu with this, that commutator. Again, I can take the constant C times sigma mu alpha alpha dot P nu Q bar alpha dot. And this has to be equal to zero. And now I can use the second equation here, the commutator of P and Q bar is what I'm left with here and also here. So the commutator of P and Q bar, that will give me a C star, so that will give um, here P, P is first. So it's another minus sign, so it's plus C squared. And then I have sigma nu alpha alpha dot, and then the P mu with Q bar, that will give us a sigma bar mu component uh, component alpha dot beta Q beta. And the same thing here. <coughs> P with Q bar, again I, can, I change the sign, so it's minus C squared sigma nu alpha alpha dot and p with q bar is a sigma bar nu because the index of of p Ta, uh, components alpha dot beta times q beta that's equal to zero Therefore, we can say factor out the c square and actually the q beta. So you can have c square factor of you have a sigma nu, sigma bar nu component uh, alpha beta minus sigma nu, sigma bar nu component alpha beta times q beta. And again, all this is equal to zero. So this, this is equal to zero. This commutator of the sigmas is one of these uh, sigma nunius. So this is different from zero, for sure. And that means that we have c squared times something which is different from zero, equal to zero. So this implies that uh, c equals zero. So that's that's very easy. So that, that means that we have now the, our second commutator, Q alpha P mu is zero. What was the uh, fast rate for that? Excuse me? What was the insightful argument? Oh very good, yes. So the other argument it will be is that in the same way that uh, that equation tells us that a Q transforms as a spinner on the, on, on the Lorentz group. Uh, so then you have to have on the right hand side the transformation of spinners. Here you say, well, Q is invariant on the translations. It's not it's, as a spinner, the translations don't do anything. So it has to be zero. Okay. But I'm sure I will have told you that and you will not have trust me. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm gaining some confidence from here. <laughs> is, is this okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Easy way. 
Sorry? What is the easy way? That's what I, I was saying. Is that the easy way is that you said that that P, I mean Q, Q, Q as a spinner doesn't fill the translations. So the right hand side is zero. In the same way that uh, over there, Q is a spinner, transform as a spinner on the Lorentz group. But under the translation group generated by P, Q doesn't fit it, so, so you have to, so, so P acting on Q doesn't give you anything, it's zero. So that's, that's it. That was the easy argument. Okay, so that's uh, B. We need this too. And we have 10 minutes, so we have to rush. Q alpha, Q beta, <coughs> Q alpha, Q beta, again it has to be, because of the index structure here the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Q's, it has to be a constant, I call K, sigma mu nu, component alpha beta, Beta. Uh, no, no. Sorry. Hmm? That's not correct. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. This is Q alpha Q beta here. This N mu. I'm sorry. I was reading. No. Actually, I'm coming directly from a 24-hour trip, so you can excuse me for this. <laughs> So, okay, so Q alpha Q beta is sigma mu nu alpha beta and mu nu. And we have to find the constant K again, but uh, there is a, an easy way of, of seeing what the constant K is. We know that uh, now because of this equation we prove, we know that this uh, left hand side, this commutes with P. Whereas this one does not commute. So the only way that these two statements are consistent is that k has to be zero. So we have q alpha, q beta, equal to zero. Okay, and to finish, I have a very, you have A, B, C already. So this is, this is the one. So we need now Q alpha, Q bar, beta dot. Sorry? You want the alpha and the beta dot? Uh, no, I think it's okay. Yes, I think we, we can, okay, yes. But I think it, 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 it fits well if, I mean, the way I have it. Otherwise, I have to use epsilon. <laughs> so again, for the, for the index structure, so this is a, well, another way to say it, this is, this is a one-half zero spinner, this is a zero one-half spinner. So on the right-hand side has to be a one-half one-half spinner, or a one-half one-half object, which is uh, the p mu. So then this has to be proportional to, so it's a constant that I call t, times sigma mu alpha beta dot times p mu. And uh, now th there is no way of fixing t. t, in principle, is arbitrary. 
Spain is not is not zero in particular. So you play all the games that I have played. You don't, you cannot use them to play to fix t. So t, so the convention is to choose t equals to two because that simplifies some of the calculations later. So then we have. And this is, a, is, is a pro probably the most uh, interesting uh, part of the supersymmetry algebra, because here you can see that the anti-commutation anti of two supersymmetries gives you a translation, because p nu is the generator of translations. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, I have to say two, two minutes. So th that means that. Uh, way to say it is that, for instance, you have Q alpha acting on a fermion that will give you a boson. Uh, and also Q or Q bar, say, acting on a, on a boson that will give you a fermion. So you have you act this on a boson, for instance, you will get Q bar will give you a fermion, and Q will give you, the fermion back will give you a boson. <coughs> so you start with a boson and end up with a boson. And but in the, on the right-hand side, it's like you start with a boson and just translate it. So the combination of two supersymmetry transformations, you go from boson to fermion, back to boson, but the original boson, translated. Take, takes a, say, a boson to a boson, but translated in a space and time because it's, it's, it's a p mu. And that's a way to see explicitly that supersymmetry is a space time symmetry. So you combine two supersymmetry transformations, gives you a translation. Excuse me, when you write those relations? Sorry? Relations in oh, why? Why is that? No, no, very good. Thank you. You have a, a boson. You act with a fermionic operator with a spinner. A spinner uh, acting on a boson that has to give you a fermion because this, it, this, this is a spinner. Is that okay? it's, for instance, you take a scalar, a scalar, multiply times times a spinner that will give you a spinner. So it, whenever you multiply by q, it changes boson to fermion. Because it has a spinorial index, so you have two spinners give you give you a boson, but a spinner in a boson give you another spinner. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. So that that is the the important property of supersymmetry that when you combine two supersymmetry transformations, that will give you a a um, translation. And if you allow me two more minutes, I finish with e. Is that okay? So, e. So, usually, as in the case of the Coleman Mandula theorem, the commutator of Q alpha and Ti are zero, except that the supersymmetry algebra has what is called an automorphism. Which change Q alpha to e to the i lambda times Q alpha and Q bar alpha dot e to the minus i lambda Q bar alpha dot. So you can see that the whole algebra, when you multiply Q by a phase and Q bar by the opposite phase, the, the whole algebra is unchanged. This part of the algebra doesn't fill it. This one, you have. <coughs> Uh, Q and M 
gives you another Q, so you multiply both sides by the face that will be invariant. This one is zero, this one is zero, and this one, since you multiply this by the face, this multiplied by the opposite face is invariant. <laughs> okay? And so this implies that this is, this is what is called an R transformation or R symmetry. And the fact that Q gets transformed under this U1, this is a U1 transformation, the fact that Q transforms under this implies that uh, Q alpha R equals to Q alpha and Q bar alpha dot R equals to Q bar alpha dot, where R is the generator. That you want. So that means that Q has charge one under R and Q bar minus one under R. And I will, again, the way this is exactly the same way that we used to prove that Q was in a speeder. This is U1 acting on Q gives you Q. And U1 acting on Q bar because of those, these two signs. It's identical. Okay, so this is an R symmetry, and an R symmetry is a symmetry that is internal, that does not commute with supersymmetry. It doesn't commute because it doesn't give you zero on the right. Okay, okay so we stop here now, and uh, we'll continue at 2.15 today.